Hello, everybody. Welcome to this month's uh, Construction Contract Administration Practice Community. So, Jim, over to you. Thank you, Matthew, and welcome, everybody, to this month's call. Um, I'm not sure if Doug Freeman, my partner, is uh, on the line. Uh, he has a really busy schedule right now in his job, and uh, we've missed him on a lot of these calls recently and hope to have him rejoin us soon. Uh, I want to also say that we've divided uh, this session into two parts because I want to be sure and take the time uh, that it deserves. So we're going to go through uh, claims section today, and then next month we'll go through disputes. Uh, so uh, that we are able to take questions. So let's go ahead, Matthew, and look at the first slide and first talk about what is a successful project so we can uh, see what is it that we're measuring against. Well, first, uh, is that project uh, finished um, on time? And is that project on budget? And is that project completed with claims resolved? So we're going to touch here on, on what a claim is. But, uh, you know, the, the, the process that we go through from uh, a, we'll call it a document, to an occupiable project, it, it naturally involves modifications. We are not perfect as human beings. Um, we make mistakes, and there are certainly places where things are unforeseen that may occur. So, you know, the whole process, as we've talked about through this whole series, uh, is very much impacted on how well uh, the architect or engineer and the owner and the contractor uh, manage these documents and manage this entire process and how we agree to deal with any kind of item that may be a claim. So you see here from the AIA documents uh, in the general conditions that many use uh, for this process, what actually is a claim? Well, that's a, that's a demand or an assertion that one party, as a matter of a right, payment of some money or some other relief uh, in respect to that contract, uh, acts on that right. So a claim is, well, we had an unforeseen circumstance here. Everyone agrees to that, and we should be paid some money and given some time to deal with it. So I want you to think about the word claim not as so much a negative, because it isn't always a negative. Uh, it is a right. Uh, there, there are things that centered around that are centered around money where uh, the contractor has that coming. So uh, some sometimes uh, we agree to disagree over claims, but these are assertions typically by the contractor. Also, can be by the owner uh, to seek some adjustment in the contract price. So I'll pause there for a second. Doug, did you get on the line? I did. Super. Sorry for. Super. Joining late, but I guess oh, no, I'm glad you're here. Absolutely, you. absolutely. Welcome. Um, anything you wanted to add to that slide before we go to the next one? No, let's, let's keep going. Okay, go ahead, Matthew. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, I'll just touch on one thing here, and then I'll hush and, and let Doug speak some. Um, this, uh, I believe, is a quote from Doug, uh, which is why I wanted to start with it. So uh, this a claim is a request that is based on a situation that differs materially from what could have been anticipated. Uh, so... Uh, Doug has a way that he describes uh, what our documents are, um, and uh, I, I, I love his definition um, centered around what construction documents uh, are supposed to be and, and what they're supposed to be used for. But let me stop talking for a minute and, and let Doug talk. Well, as, as Jim mentioned before, claims are not necessarily 
a negative, um, there's probably going to be a claim on every project. And if you take claim in terms of what the word means itself, is I'm claiming that I'm do something. I'm do more time. I'm do more money. I'm do uh, whatever. Uh, and as Jim says, it can be from the contractor or from the owner. Um, so it's how you deal with claims, change orders or claims. It's how you deal with them that makes the difference and can change a, a project from a bad experience to a good experience and vice versa. Um, don't try to avoid them. Don't run from them. Address them straight on. Deal with them. Deal with them fairly, equitably, and professionally. Jim, you were you were going to say something? I'm I, I just agreeing with you in um, that handling these things as expeditiously as possible uh, often keeps them from turning into more than they need to. Um, you know, Doug has said in the past that um, that documents are not a set of instructions like an erector set uh, of how to put a building together, but are more a general description uh, of an end result. And um, in that regard, there is no perfect set of documents, and there are places that <clears throat> will be, uh, I guess I could use the word unspecific enough that, that materially you couldn't tell. Uh, and so that's where claims can originate. But uh, Matthew, let's go to the next slide and start to talk about where they originate and uh, see if anybody has their hands raised. Yeah, as this slide pops up, we did have a couple of questions that came in here. So uh, kind of going off of what Doug was talking about, the first question came in from Sarah saying, uh, is a claim only made after a product, a project completion, um, or could you satisfy a claim with a change order or add service? Claims can come at any time. Uh, it's not just after the project is over. So the, arch the contractor's out, he's digging a footing, and he runs into a sewer line that no one knew was there. And the sewer line has to be relocated so that the building can go where it needs to go. That's an unforeseen condition. The contractor has a claim for more time and money to relocate the sewer line. Um, so that's at the very beginning of the project. So they, they can come at any any course any, at any moment during the course of the, of the project. Was there a second part of that question about waiting until the end? Did I hear that right, Matthew? Uh, yeah, it was just saying is that essentially could um, a change order, um, you know, um, substitute or essentially address a claim, um, you know, before the end of the project? Well, the answer to that is yes. Um, like I said, a change order is a claim. If a contractor is submitting a proposal requesting a change, that's a claim. He's claiming that he's entitled to whatever the change order is requesting. Um, as we all know, not all change requests that come from contractors are valid, and so not all of them uh, turn into a signed, executed change order document. But the request is the claim. The change order is the change order request is, is a claim where the contractor is saying I am do something. Um, I thought, and maybe it's because my hearing is bad, <laughs> that part of that question was waiting till the end of the project. And I think Jim would agree is that you should not wait until the end of the project to address and deal with and resolve claims. You should do it expeditiously as they as they arise. Um, memories get stale, uh, people change locations, so you, all the information that you might need to resolve the claim may not be available if you wait too long. Yeah, uh, so the, the, the part of the question at the beginning was could a claim only happen at the end or could it happen during the middle? So that's where you were hearing that. Um, we have some additional comments here from Kevin before we have an additional 
question as well. Uh, so Kevin just pops in, you're seeing change orders and change proposals are not always claims under the contract. Uh, as EJCBC's C700 establishes um, a process for change proposals that is outside the formal claims process. A claim, in quotes, is an escalation, a substantive disagreement between the parties. Um, and also points out here that contracts typically have a time limit on when claims should be submitted. So waiting to the end to file a claim may result in rejection of the claim based on timeliness. So two things to think in mind from Kevin. And then we had a comment slash question coming in here from Hassan saying, in a GMAX contract based on schematic or bridging documents, when the owner refuses to pay for changes in scope of work or not fully um, delineating in the CD, is can this situation be considered a claim? Huh. Jim, I'm going to try to be brief and let you jump in here real quick. I disagree with Kevin, and it's rare that I disagree with Kevin. Um, Kevin's been joining us on these uh, webinars for a long time. But I think it's probably just the difference between the AIA, AIA language and the uh, – I'm drawing a blank on the on the other documents. Yeah, uh, EJCDC. EJCDC document language. Um, a claim, from my view, is different than a dispute, and I think we'd, we'll touch on this a little bit later in the in the presentation here. And I think what Kevin was getting at is that um, a dispute is a disagreement on a claim, basically. Um, so from my perspective, from I believe consistent with the AIA documents, is the request for something that you feel you're entitled to is a claim. Uh, it may not be a dispute. It may not rise to a, a level where you're fighting over it, but technically it is a claim. Um, and I agree with the other comment that came through about not waiting till the end. I think, well, we had briefly touched on that before. Jim? Yeah. Um, if Matthew, if we can, uh, if Kevin could be unmuted here for a second, maybe he could describe um, something uh, from what his perspective is about a claim. And I, I think, I think we're agreeing with what he said but uh maybe calling it something different yeah so kevin um, actually added in a comment here and kevin please let me know if you want me to unmute your line as well but he said that the reason the ejcdc provisions uh um is that contractors often object to the stigma of a claim um as sometimes um statements often ask how many claims do you have on file for your project uh but kevin says sure to unmute so kevin um let's see here I have unmuted your line, so Kevin, if you wanted to join in, feel free. Well, hello, folks. Um, and I think uh, uh, it's something of a matter of terminology, but um, I, it just in my own experience, I don't see too many project teams, <clears throat> whether using the AIA documents or the older editions of EJCDC, which had a very similar claims process. I don't see too many project teams that actually follow those or even enforce them or half the time even seem to be aware of them. There's often a, uh, a desire to just amicably negotiate changes in the project as we go along and maybe not call them claims or whatever. And, you know, not to belabor the point, I understand what uh, Doug is saying. Um, and uh, it just I, I just wanted to throw out there that a claim as a defined term in the general conditions is certainly uh, an important matter. Um, EJCDC took this different approach with its general conditions five years ago simply because the contractor sitting at the table and providing input said, we don't like to have the stigma of having to file a claim uh, every time there's a differing site condition. It makes us look bad that we're you know, filing claims all the time, even if it's not our fault. So, um, you know, that's why one of the reasons why EJCDC went to, a, I guess, a lower level process of the change proposal and the claim is a more substantive disagreement that might arise out of um, a failure of the parties to agree upon a change order. So just, again, without, without belaboring, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. 
Absolutely, Kevin. Thank you, man. And I and so this this is um, this is inherent and important uh, in our business that for whatever reasons you know we do look at the word claim uh, as a negative, and and it's a huge change, I guess, in culture to try to start to talk about it in something otherwise and I agree uh, with what you said and I know Doug does too about how claims are viewed um, we both have either worked for or competed against firms that would say that they had one change order on a job um, when in fact that one change order had 35 different items uh compiled up into it uh, and they would use that as a moniker to say you know we only had, only had this one claim on a job uh, and and they wouldn't use the word claim again because of exactly what Kevin said it had this negative connotation and um, and so to address also what Sarah was saying that you know do you wait to the end uh, many firms uh, tend to try to do that. Uh, and and that way they can say they only had one change order on the project. Um, so Doug, stop me here uh, if you want to add any further to that, or we'll just uh, begin to talk about where these originate. Let's, let's keep going. I think uh, we covered okay. everything. Oh, I wanted to just we wanted to circle back to Hassan's question as well that came in after Kevin's comment. Uh, so reminder, Hassan's question was. Um, in a contract based on schematic and bridging documents, when the owner refuses to pay for changes in scopes of work or not fully delineated in the CDs, can that situation be considered a claim? Well, Doug, following, you, you go ahead first. If I'm following the question right, I would say yes, that is a claim. The contractor has run into a situation where he feels that he's entitled to additional money and the owner refused to pay for it. That's a claim. The, the contractor is saying, I'm due money. That's the claim. And, and when the owner goes to the next step and says, well, I'm not paying you, and that's when it becomes a dispute. Jim? And I think, yes, I, I think the term claim does apply to the example you gave um, as as defined in these previous slides where there uh, may be a variation in a document that is materially different um, than it, it could be defined as a claim. And perhaps we'll come across uh, a, a more detailed answer is we're looking here at where they originate. Um, so, uh, Matthew, if you'll if you'll see if that question comes in again, we'll come back to that. And uh, if we didn't respond sufficiently there, uh, so so these claims that we're talking about can come from the contractor or subcontractors or suppliers that are uh, feeding material through them. They can be filed by the owner. Uh, against the contractor, or they may be filed by others that aren't even a party to the contract. So we'll take a look at these in a little more detail. Uh, Matthew, let's look at the contractor slide, uh, the next one. And so uh, where might contractor claims originate? Uh, well, the, the project pricing or the cost is based on uh, what we would call procurement or contract documents and everything that can be reasonably foreseen at that time uh, related to the project. And as we've discussed, conditions can change um, and uh, whatever those changes are must be clearly documented and, and given to the contractor in a timely manner so that then the responses, uh, as we're, as Doug and I are defining claims, uh, may be through these kinds of examples that you see on the right of the screen. There may be some interference, 
Uh, we've all had perhaps projects where floor plans change from time to time to time to time. And so uh, that would be a, a claim from the contractor based on uh, what was in existence when the original pricing was provided. Uh, there may be conditions beyond everyone's control, such as weather. Uh, I, I can't imagine what the claims process might be like right now in the northeastern part of the United States. Uh, if there's anybody that's on the phone that is in that area, I'd be curious to know how your projects are doing, if you'd be willing to offer it. Um, unforeseen conditions, things that are underground that we can't see, or perhaps modifications that are, are made uh, during the process of a job uh, that there's a change in use or the owner's uh, idea of a different uh, service to provide. And then, of course, there are things that are might be errors or omissions that uh, the architect or engineer left out of their documents uh, in the beginning. So these are examples of where the contractor might be uh, submitting claims for a project. Um, Doug or Matthew, any questions or follow-up? Uh, we, for me. We did have one question that came in here. Are, the, are there potential for cl of claims on manager at risk contract and the parentheses there are the partnering contract? That's a good not, question. I, I don't know. I'm not uh, familiar with the term manager at risk. Um, unless we're talking about a, a CM construction manager at risk. But I think that's what they mean, Doug. I think that's okay. the question. It's a good well, question. I, that's a good question. Is, are, well, when you run to if it's a, even if it's a <clears throat> at risk contract, if you're running into unforeseen conditions, that's something that nobody anticipated. That's going to be uh, a claim that I would think the contractor's entitled to pursue. I think it's one of those questions that starts off with it depends. Also, um, you know what what kind of analysis was required or a part of the contract uh, when they assume that risk uh, as Doug just defined you know if it's if it's site and there were no soil borings and maybe that is uh, that that proposal is submitted as uh, classified and so uh, they don't undertake that part within the risk are the weather issues with a with, uh, storm coming through right. or a lightning strike in the fire or... Right. Matthew, let's take a look at the next slide unless there are others and um, talk about where owner claims may originate. Perhaps these would be based in defective or non-conforming work that uh, affected the, the project itself or the schedule of the project. Um, maybe there are damages uh, of existing property if it's a renovation or an addition where uh, existing property has been affected negatively. Um, perhaps there are um, liquidated or compensatory damages related to the type of project you're working on, retail centers that miss their biggest sales market of the year, uh, for example. And then there are uh, a long list here that you see of perhaps ineffective project management. And you notice that it doesn't say owner claims just against the contractor, but uh, that these could be um, related to shop drawing issues or reviews uh, multiple substitutions of various makes and models of different uh, products, uh, perhaps interference with their operations. Um, if, in fact, uh, as the example of a renovation or addition may impact the existing facility, um, or 
perhaps the designers are asking for additional compensation because of site visits, because of the late project delivery, schedule overruns, et cetera. So these are not meant to be exhaustive lists, but just examples of where uh, an owner may make some claims uh, on a project. And um, again, Doug, if you have anything to add here, and uh, Matthew, if there are any questions, let us know, or uh, in the absence of either one, we'll go to the next slide. Matthew, if we don't have any questions, then yep. let's proceed on. And uh, so we spoke a little bit about uh, potentially parties that have nothing to do with the contract uh, being involved in claims. Um, one, uh, which you see here, uh, might be adjacent property owners who are affected by negatively by uh, something that's going on uh, at the job site. Uh, we uh, here in Raleigh, North Carolina, recently had a large fire uh, at a project that was under construction, which damaged all of the perimeter buildings uh, around the site uh, that were either apartments or condos uh, to the point that they had to empty the structures uh, because of the damage. So uh, those people certainly weren't party to the contract, but they certainly had claims against the uh, project site owners and contractors. Um, also, uh, there may be um, an impact by adjacent property owners uh, because of uh, damage that may be not apparent right away, but happens over time. Um, I guess we've all read about the Millennial Tower in uh, California that may be settling, maybe not be settling because of work that's going on adjacent to the property. Um, and of course, uh, there may be an issue of death uh, or injury related to uh, a party uh, and, you know, the the bridge at the uh, university in Florida is an example of uh, how uh, some third party claims will have to be uh, dealt with in that failure. Uh, so it's not always someone that's directly related to the contract uh, that may have claims on a project. Um, Doug, do you have any comments or Matthew, any questions? Only comment I would share at this point is typically in the contract there are procedures set up for dealing with claims. And just to point out here that these third parties that are not a party to the contract are not held to those same requirements that are in the contracts when it comes to claims. You could have a claim or a contract between an owner and a contractor that says everything is going to go to arbitration. The third party is not party to that agreement does not have to stick to that arbitration clause so they can pursue a direct action through the courts without having to go through arbitration. So just remember that when you're dealing with third party claims that uh, the procedures for resolving them don't necessarily have to follow the procedures that you've set up in your contract. That's a great point. Uh, Matthew, any questions at this point? Yeah, we had uh, two questions that kind of came in here. One of them, I'm not sure um, if you want to address now or maybe later in the call, but in a project delivery method such as IPD, where the architect, owner, and contractor have shared risk, how are claims or disputes resolved at that point? Typically, well, I'll I'm go sorry. Ahead, I don't know. No, go ahead. Typically, in those uh, types of projects, uh, integrated delivery projects, there are procedures and and processes within the contract to deal with how to handle claims. It's just because everybody's signing the same contract does not mean that they're going to agree throughout the course of the project. And. Uh, what I think I've seen most often in those types of contracts is that there's usually a panel 
or some kind of a, a mediation or arbitration agreement where the parties are to sit down in good faith and try to negotiate through any disagreements that they have. Uh, Jim? That's what I was going to say, Doug, exactly. The, 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 my experience is that there is a claims dispute committee uh, that is agreed upon uh, prior to the integrated project delivery process and and if it's possible and most times it is and they would help arbitrate or mediate that that solution that's been my experience too matthew what was the next question yeah we had kevin also wanted to just join in on that saying most contracts regardless of the project delivery method include some provisions governing the claims and disputes um, but it's tough to answer how claims are handled in IPD because there are different colors and approaches taken to implementing the IPD process. Um, but we had another question that came in here from Joseph saying, um, could you speak to the architect's ability to file claims with the owner and how the B101 slash 201, um, what constitutes an ad service and how to go about requesting this from an owner? Um, the contractor has a means of requesting change orders, and it does not seem to have the same stigma as an ad service does to architects. Uh, I'll start by saying I'm excited you asked the question because uh, it, it, I think often we don't. Um, as you described, we're, it seems like there's a stigma uh, related to anything that we look for uh, in additional fees that isn't necessarily or may not necessarily be tied to the same uh, kind of reaction from a change order proposal. I'm not, I'll, I'll also say that I'm, my overall answer is I'm just not sure. Um, I think, I feel like personally is something that we have done to ourselves um, just in historically over time, uh, been timid or shy about documenting what is an additional service. I, I've had the good fortune to work in some large engineering, small architecture firms. And uh, as a shout out to any engineering friends that might be on the phone, I will say that they have this well-defined um, if you have a uh, project work plan and you have the project scoped as many uh, of my engineering friends did where they tell you how many hours per sheet uh, it's going to take them to produce a document, they stick uh, very stringently to those totals and they share those uh, with their clients. And I'm talking about firms that I've worked in. Um, and then it, it, it became, I guess, let me start over slightly by saying when we have a well-defined scope of service upon which we base our contract, it is much easier to approach an owner to say, boy, here's something that uh, is outside the scope. Uh, some of the AIA contracts are uh, fill-in-the-blank types that force us a little bit to go through and define exactly what our scope of service is. And I know at the time that those contracts were being developed, the intention was a little bit to force us to sit down and do that very thing so that our clients knew. Uh, for example, yes, these uh, large uh, drawings that we're going to do to help uh, do fundraising for the project are included, but if you want others in the future, they are not, uh, so that we would be asking for more money for different perspectives or larger details, or wh whatever the case may be. So yeah, I think part of what we need to do as practitioners is to focus on the development of that scope of work. Uh, because then we are able to say what isn't. I, I hope that makes sense. Um, and then I'll, I'll say one more. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, I, no, go, you go ahead. I, I agree with you 100%. You have to have a well-defined scope 
And once the scope is well defined, it's so much easier when something comes up that's outside that scope to identify this as an additional service. The other thing I would say is I think the AIA's documents make it fairly easy and quick for an additional services claim to be processed. Um, it's a one-page additional services form where the architect pulls or fills out these typical project information and identifies what the additional service is, what the fee will be, and it's a one-pager. You can attach documents if you need to, and then you sign it and the owner signs it. And I often have heard uh, the excuse that it's going to slow down the project. We can't wait for an additional services, do the work, and then you do the work, and then the owner says, well, I'm not paying it. I've always said, don't turn over the goods until you come to that agreement that you're going to get paid for. Uh, you could go ahead and start preparing whatever the additional services documents are, but I would not release them until um, your owners acknowledge that, yeah, this is just additional services and I'm going to pay for it. And it's, all he's got to do is sign a, a document. You've already prepared it for him. You get it in front of him. It takes, what, seconds to sign your name to it. So I, I've seen too often times in the course of my career where it's clearly an additional service, where the owner even admits it's an additional service. The architect's performed the service, delivered the documents, the work gets done, and then the owner denies payment. And at that point, you got to make a business decision. Is it worth it for me to risk my relationship with this owner or risk my reputation by filing a lawsuit against him? So it's so much easier to get all of that settled up front. Don't give the goods until you have that agreement. Jim, I cut you off. That's, no, no, no. That that's that was good. I um I think Matthew, unless we have any more questions, we maybe should start to talk about. The next couple of slides, which are critical steps and and how all claims are dealt with. Any questions? Uh, no other questions. Just we had some comments that came in here. I'm going to read them quick while the slide switches over. Just saying, professional service contracts almost always have a less defined and more informal process for claims. Half the time, the parties to the professional service contract don't even know uh, the full nature of the situation causing the claim. Uh, when one party, often the owner, files a claim against the other. Uh, often the claims and disputes process is a professional services contract. In, uh, sorry, often the claims and disputes process are in a professional services contract and mingle together, and often the parties will resort in private mitigation, or, or, sorry, mediation to resolve the claims under a professional services contract. And I know we talk about mediation in a few slides, so I just wanted to add that in there. Um, but feel free to move on to the critical steps. Okay, and so great, great segue into you know the our documents in the standard general conditions uh, provide for the mechanics of seeking relief for claims, uh, and in those documents, it reserves, of course, the rights of all the parties. And as Doug was describing, the owner and the contractor under uh, the legal concept of privity of contract may make claims against each other. In other words, the subcontractors have to go through the general contractor uh, if they have claims. But of course, this doesn't apply to a third party that isn't uh, contracted with any of the parties uh, related to the project. Whatever the steps are and whatever the process is, uh, Doug points this out all the time, uh, and we both do in these conversations. Handling things in a timely manner uh, and being effective, being fair and impartial uh, in whatever this methodology is related to the claim is critical. Uh, it will not get better with time. These claims are not like a fine wine. You don't need to let them breathe. You need to undertake the solutions and move forward with that. And uh, so we'll, we'll let's go to the next slide, which are also uh, a part of the critical steps, uh, especially when these claims involve money. 
uh, and, and often they do, and sometimes it's large sums of money, then as we're going through the process, it can't be said enough to document what's going on, um, to document beginning, middle, end throughout the process. Uh, so uh, if it's a contractor claim, then they're responsible for documenting what the subject of the claim is. If it wasn't foreseeable at the time of pricing, that's what they've got to do. Uh, if it's a non-performance issue, then that's got to be explicitly documented. So look to your partner, the contractor, to provide you all the detail you need. It's not just simply a statement, bad soil, $300,000. There's a lot more information that you need to have in order to assess or uh, make a comment about a claim. If it's an owner claim, um, then it could be that if the contract says so, that it may be grounds for withholding payment. So again, same type of documentation. It's got to be explicitly described, and anything revolving the withholding of payment should be a very last resort. So dealing with the claims through the documentation process is absolutely paramount in managing your project. And we're going to, uh, on the next slide, start to talk about the submission of a claim. Uh, Matthew, we can go to that one or take some questions. Jim, I just want to jump in on uh, absolutely. Sorry, Dave. About, no, you're fine. About um, subcontractors filing a claim through the general contractor, and that is the general rule. That's standard contract law. There are some jurisdictions, and North Carolina is one of them, where there have been case law that has been passed that will allow, in certain cases, the subcontractor or the supplier to go bring a claim directly against the owner without having to go through the general. So I just wanted to point that out and you need to be aware of what those rules are in your particular jurisdiction. That's a great point. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, there we, we have some funny case law and some things like that. And I imagine there are a lot of places that, that may have similar uh, gotchas that you weren't thinking about or didn't see in your document. Um, so, let's, Matthew, were there any questions before we go any further? Uh, no, not at the moment. Okay. So, wait, uh, go back one. Sorry about that. So, the uh, our, our documents again uh, establish uh, a process and our procedure. Often, they uh, set the architect or engineer as the impartial interpreter of the documents and specifically says this, um, unless uh, perhaps you've changed that um, in your documents. It also uh, establishes us as the initial decision maker. So this begins to establish the steps, that, the procedure that would uh, be adhered to in the submission of a claim. Uh, the EJCDC documents say that that will be, that the claim will be, or the documents of the claim will be submitted to the engineer. Um, there's required notifications of parties, time limits for those uh, submissions. Um, we, we're, we're talking about something that's critical to the management of the project, and there have been some previous comments. Uh, Sarah, I think it was talked about waiting until the end to submit claims uh, and it, it as we said is always good to submit them as, a, as they occur most of our contract documents require that they get submitted when they occur and there's a time limit for that submission and yet still on so many projects we get to the end uh, I, I think there's Doug made the comment about people getting forgetful and, and moving on from one company to another. Memories are bad. Uh, there often are claims at the end that happened so long ago. And, you know, should we, can we, do we process them, undertake the consideration of them, and 
the answer most often is, yeah, we do. Um, as Doug said, it's, a, it's about a client relationship, a contractor relationship. If you do a lot of work in your state, uh, the construction community gets very small and reputations spread very wide. So often we find ourselves in a predicament of undertaking reviews of things that perhaps we shouldn't and most definitely are in our contract documents that say we don't have to. So those are determinations that you are going to make as a pr practitioner about what you are willing to do. So, you know, delaying of those submissions is just not something that should happen. And uh, both Doug and I have used documents in construction administration where we tried to establish ways where we reminded folks of those time limits. Well, we are at a certain point and we're not going to accept any more after today's meeting. Um, but whatever is submitted, it should include everything. If it's money, okay, we need to know how much. If it's time, same thing. We need to know how much. Uh, and once all that documentation is pulled together in total, then uh, the, whichever party is doing so can submit that claim. So, Matthew, unless there's a question, let's look at the next page. Yeah, we actually have a bunch of stuff that came in here. Um, so just wanted a heads up. Uh, since 2013, the EJCVC docs do not have the engineer in the claims process. Rather, like, like, a, rather, like a design build contract, the EC, EJCVC C700's claims process requires that the owner and contractor negotiate claims in good faith. Parties may resort to mediation during such that such a negotiation. So heads up on that. Um, additional comments that came in here is, in my experience, because owners and contractors are often afraid to lawyer up and go to arbitration or court, after the IDM's um, decision, sorry, de decision on the claim is issued, they wind up sitting down to negotiate it anyway. I rarely see owners and contractors accepting the IDM's decision and yet also being reluctant to go to mediation or arbitration. Um, and often architects are designated as um, initial decision maker. Disputes often occur when the initial decision maker refuses to accept those errors and omissions in the CDs. Um, does this lead to disputes with the mediation, arbitration, or lawsuits? Can you read that last question again? Yeah, sorry. I was I didn't notice it was a question until the very end because it didn't end in a question mark. So uh, often architects are designated um, as initial decision maker. Uh, disputes often end when the initial decision maker refuses to accept errors or omissions in the CDs. Uh, does this lead to disputes with mediation, arbitration, or lawsuits? Okay. Let me take a stab at that. If the initial decision maker is the architect and a contractor submitted a claim because of an error in the documents and the initial decision maker is trying to cover his rear end and denies the claim or doesn't acknowledge it or whatever. Yes, that could lead to um, taking it to the next step. And I think that's, that's spelled out in the AI documents is that the initial decision maker um, once he makes his initial decision that the parties, the owner and the contractor can, if they don't agree, take it to the next step, be it mediation or arbitration, depending on how you got your contract set up. So yes, uh, that can happen. If the initial, the initial decision maker just ignores it and doesn't want to deal with it at all, then again, the owner or the contractor, based on the documents, can take it to the next step, be it mediation arbitration or litigation, again, depending on ter the terms of your contract. Okay, we had yeah. an additional question coming in here from James asking, in front of a dispute review board, who represents the owner's claim? The engineer? Question mark, in reference to the EJCDC. I, I would that, say... That, Go ahead, Go ahead Doug. Well, I was just going to say uh, I, that would, I guess, uh, again, it, I don't mean to be evasive, but it would depend on the documents related to that individual project. Um, it may be that the 
Uh, I would assume most owners would have an attorney representing them in a dispute uh, situation like that, perhaps, uh, or it would just be the owner representing uh, themselves in that situation. But I don't know, Doug, I'll hush. Well, I was going to say the same thing. It, it, it might depend on the situation. Um, I could see a situation where it may be that the design professional is representing the owner, but I would think if the, I was the, an owner and I was going before a board, I would want somebody with some type of legal experience representing me and would be relying on my design professional for their professional expertise and their professional opinions. But in terms of the proceedings, I would want a expert in that area and would want an attorney to represent me. Yeah, I was just going to add, and Kevin agreed here, but pointed out um, in the case of EJCDC, they do not have provisions for a dispute review board. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Right. Well, Matthew, let's take a look at the next slide. So uh, the next two slides we'll talk about here are related to the processing of the claim. Uh, and the third slide. Uh, is a document right out of the practice guide that I think is really handy to see the connection between the various parties of a claim and uh, what happens when things go smoothly and how things get redirected if, if there are some uh, roadblocks in the process. So uh, this processing, uh, of course, um, revolves around the word entitlement and I've heard Doug uh, in various places throughout the practice guide uh, talk about, and, and these webinars talk about entitlement. Um, of course, that's the right to benefits. And uh, that, as Doug said a second ago, it depends on where you're practicing. Uh, so it's important to know what the law is there and how the contract that you're using uh, is worded uh, to fit within that law of where you're doing your work. So the contractor's uh, entitlement is established by deciding whether or not that work is in the original contract documents. Is it reasonably inferred? Um, there's a decision to make there. Yes, there's enough information uh, or no, there's not. And if there isn't, then this might be a valid claim. So we're moving to uh, the second step. So let's say yes, uh, it, it wasn't reasonably inferable and the claim is valid, then is the timing appropriate? Was it submitted when it should be? And certainly was it submitted before the work is accomplished? Um, that, that giving the owner the opportunity to consider other options. Uh, and so then if, if we're not answering those things with well, yes, all that was done properly, then it might be an invalid claim. I know Doug has, and I have too, worked on projects that where things were done um, and finished before a claim was reviewed and processed and agreed upon. And that's, a, that's not a predicament you want to put yourself in. Uh, so, those are those are points about contractor's entitlement, but the owner may also have entitlement, and it it follows the same course of action. Is it actually uh, is it entitlement? Was this work that the owner is making a claim about was it reasonably inferred in the contract documents or not? Um, and these things should be determined uh, and decided upon as you move forward in the process uh, you know because if it's not then uh, the owner's claim could be uh, upheld to receive work at no additional cost if in fact that was um, that was decided that no this claim is not valid that work is is reasonably inferred and so uh, no there'll be no additional cost um, let, let's go to the next slide. All this uh, is all part of the same explanation, Matthew, and then we'll take questions because um, we might have a minute to do that right at the end. 
Um, so if you'll look at the next slide, if the that's it, that's right, if entitlement is established, then how is that procedure uh, implemented? Well, again, it's all about documentation and whether it's substantially documented so that we can understand the claim. Uh, we've got to review it. It's, we've talked about it being submitted in a timely fashion. Now we've got to review it and make a judgment. Uh, is it accepted or denied? Um, we, of course, need to go through the process of confirming it's all based on our contract. Is it a lump sum price? Are there unit prices? If there's schedule involved, uh, we need to review that and either accept or deny that it did have implications or it didn't. Um, are there outside agencies that are involved? And if so, have we got that information together? So if it's rock and rock was removed, then was it quantified properly by independent parties? Uh, were there any site observations to document that that need to be wrapped into the review of the claim? Once all that is together uh, and we've had a chance to review as engineers or architects, um, then we can render a decision which should be thoughtful, should be impartial, and should be in writing so that everyone can understand our review. Um, and that's the processing of the claim. Uh, Everyone can mutually agree to um, waive requirements, and we and there was a question that touched on this, a comment, sorry, that touched on this a minute ago. That all parties mutually agree that we're not going to do that, then we might just sit down and negotiate and compromise on a settle on a settlement or a solution that uh, is agreeable to everyone. Well, sometimes that happens and uh, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but again, the, any of our actions that we take should be based on reasonable expectations and done in a professional, ethical, and uh, fair manner. So that's a quick review of processing the claims. And Doug, I'd like for you to, to add to any of those uh, before we ask for any questions, and then we'll we'll close with the questions. We're getting low on time. I really don't have anything to add. I'd, as this next slide pops up, it is a, a good representation of the process. If you don't have the um, manual, you can uh, refer to it here uh, in this slide. But I think it's it's does a good job of outlining the claims process. So, Matthew, do we have any questions? Yeah, we had one question that came in here. Um, what's your experience with rejecting a claim based on procedural grounds, such as that uh, it was not submitted in a timely manner? I have done it before. Um, typically, what I will do if I don't, if it, if it's a late claim, but it's a valid claim. I mean, it's you got to kind of look at the totality of the circumstances. I have done it before, um, but there are some times where a claim is coming late, and I've discussed it with the owner, and then the owner's made a decision. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, and even though he's late, we're going to go through the process anyway. So I would typically would not just deny it and send it back without first discussing it with the owner. Um, but I, I've done it before, and I've certainly seen insurance companies come back and then denied claims because they weren't submitted in a timely manner. I, I want to comment on that too, Matthew. I, I had the same same response that Doug did, um, and typically the owners want to work with the construction community, uh, particularly public agencies, because they're going to see them again. I'll also say I, I've had a situation where uh, something was submitted after the contractor received final payment uh, for the project and it just discovered that they hadn't billed for something that, in fact, everyone had agreed to as an additional cost and everyone had agreed was, uh, was not a part of the contract documents. And for a state agency, 
unfortunately, there was nothing anybody could do. Um, the contractor could not be paid because the contract was formally closed. And uh, they were willing to chalk that up to a hard lesson learned. And all of us that were involved with that job, um, you know, just could only uh, admonish ourselves and look back to everything we've just talked about here today as uh, a way that we should operate to be sure that that doesn't happen. And that's why it says don't do the work before, you know, the, the formal process has been undertaken. Any other questions? Uh, no, Kevin just closes it out with his usual jokey self, saying so much for that final waiver of claims clause. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right, man. I know. It was crazy. Anyway, um, well, I I'll let Doug have the last word. I appreciate everyone being here, and um, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the process of uh, managing disputes uh, at, in the next session, which goes along with this session of claims. Doug, I'll turn it over to you. Glad to have you here, man. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining in, and we hope to have you back next month as we talk about uh, resolving claims. Matthew, you want to take us home? All right, perfect. Well, uh, current schedule has us probably meeting on April 24th for our next meeting, so everybody put that on your calendar now. Um, information on the meeting and the registration link will be on the website and in emails in the next couple of weeks. A uh, reminder to everybody, again, today's session was recorded. That recording will be posted onto the CSA YouTube channel uh, in a few days after we clean up some of the housekeeping stuff that isn't relevant to a recorded session uh, and get that encoded and uploaded. Uh, lastly, a reminder, following today's session, you should receive an email from GoToWebinar uh, with what time we are right now. looks like it'll come in probably about 2.10 Eastern um, to your inbox. It's automated from GoToWebinar. That'll include a link to downloading today's slides um, as well as a link to a survey if you wish to share some information is for additional questions on today's call, topics for future sessions you'd love for us to talk about, and again, to request that self-reporting um, certificate of attendance that you can use for uh, letting individuals know that you attended today's session. Uh, so with that, I do want to thank everybody for coming, and thank you for staying a few minutes after the hour. Thank you again to Jim and Doug, as you always do a great job on these sessions, uh, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.